And welcome back to the Fighting Saints Report. Jack Molesky and Jim Leitner sitting down on this Monday evening, and we'll look at the playoff picture in both the Eastern and Western Conferences. We'll start with the Western Conference so we can end with the Fighting Saints and the playoff bubble that they are in right now. Tri-City became the second team this season to clinch a playoff spot over the weekend. They needed, uh, they had all types of clinching scenarios. They got one of them. What was the easiest one to do? Just a win. So Tri-City is officially in the Clark Cup playoffs. 75 points. I think they'll probably lock up a number one seed here at some point this month, but the way the teams are playing behind them, it's not going to be super easy. Waterloo and Sioux Falls are now tied, and Sioux Falls has a game in hand on the Waterloo Blackhawks, 66 points apiece. That's going to be an interesting battle for that second seed in a first <coughs> round bye in the playoffs. And then Fargo is charging. They have 58 points. They've surpassed Des Moines, who's really struggling. Des Moines is now in fifth in their 3 6 0 and 1 in their last 10. And then the other battle is Sioux City and Omaha. Sioux City, 48 games played, 51 points. Omaha, 49 games played, 48 points. It's a gap of only three where two months ago this gap was double digits. And last year, Omaha made a big push. They got into the playoffs. It was a huge second half run that propelled them there. Much like we might be seeing this year 6 2 and 2 in their last 10, three points back. Now there's at least a conversation of a different six than we thought originally making it in the Western Conference. The seeding's still up for grabs very much, but now Omaha has a legit chance to make the playoffs. They're going to kind of make us look bad, aren't they? They might. If they if they go back and look at the recordings that we did from uh, a month ago or... I think we right counted them out like Chris, right after the Christmas yeah, oh break. Oh, yeah. We had, them, we had them counted out and... I think at that point, weren't they making deals? They were still making deals. They traded They traded their leading scorer, Brendan Furry. They traded Callie Erickson, who's their best defenseman. And it looked like they were just fire sale. Matteo DiCethal, who went to Chicago. Yeah. He was on their team. And it, it did. It looked like a fire sale. It looked like you know, they were tra- trading all their better players to you know contenders to make them better. And it looked like they were just basically building for the future. It's it's funny how that happens. So you get uh, sometimes it's addition by subtraction. You you become better when you you know trade away a guy who might not fit right with your team. And mm-hmm. it's a it's a really a credit to David Wilkie and his staff for the way they've developed this team uh, at a point where not only were they down and out around Christmas time, but they were moving players. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people were giving up on this season. A lot of people in Omaha were were giving up on the season and and thinking that they were pretty much out of it and and didn't really have much of a chance. So uh, it's a credit to them for the the charge that they've made. You'd like to see them rewarded for it uh, if you're a a hockey fan. But on the other hand, I think uh, Sioux City is a team that I think is going to get better after this weekend. Yeah, Martin Pospisil comes back uh, from an 11-game suspension that stemmed with uh, altercation in Omaha. He'll be out for the Friday game, but he'll be back Saturday, and so that's a huge addition, and Bobby Brink is still lighting it up for the Sioux City Musketeers, but they are a very top-heavy team that will benefit a lot, I think, from Pospisil coming back. Gut feeling right now, I I think it's safe to say that we both agree Tri-City is going to be able to maintain that number one slot in the Western Conference. Now it's just more of a battle between... uh, Tri-City and Muskegon for the Anderson Cup title. They're two points separated. Tri-City has one game in hand. But looking at Waterloo and Sioux Falls, they're eight points separated from Fargo in fourth place. They're tied right now, uh, effectively in second place at 66 points. Gut feeling, who gets that second place finish in the first round by Waterloo or Sioux Falls? I think I'm going to go with Sioux Falls, to be honest. I, I just think they've been playing better hockey down the stretch. And... Uh, and Waterloo's kind of been a bit of an enigma. They just haven't uh, they haven't put everything together the way I thought they would. You know, I thought they were I thought Waterloo would be a team that would contend for the for the Anderson Cup again, and and they really haven't. So, but Sioux Falls is a team that's charging, and you know, you almost always have to go with the team that's playing better, a team that's hot, and I think that's Sioux Falls. So I think they're the team that's going to do it in these last five weeks. Then we'll move over to the Eastern Conference and 12 points ahead of the pack. Muskegon, they have clinched a playoff spot as well. 50 games, that's the most played in the USHL. They're 35-12. 
two and one, and they're not nearly the unstoppable dominant force that we talked about earlier in the season. And that being said, they're still seven and three in their past ten. They still have 197 goals for, which is the most in the league this season, and 133 against, which is the third lowest mark or fourth lowest mark, rather I should say, in the USHL. So they're still a very balanced team. The thing that jumps out to Muskegon when looking at the stats is both special teams are really struggling for them mm -hmm. as of late. They're, I believe, ninth and tenth in power play and then penalty kill, respectively, for the Lumberjacks. So that's an that's an area where in the playoffs it might expose a weakness and they might not be a surefire contender in the Eastern Conference. Uh, but they're they're a lock for that number one seed. I, I'm safe in. The, I'm gonna say that they're not gonna make me look bad in the way Omaha is right now. No. They're a lock for the number one seed. Chicago is 12 points back, 61 points in second. CR is only three points back of them with 58 points in third place. Youngstown, three points back of CR with four, or 55 rather in fourth place. And then Dubuque is at 51 points and four points back of Youngstown, but just two ahead of Team USA. It's really tight right there. And outside of Muskegon, I think now you have the discussion, which you didn't a long time ago or a couple months ago, where CR could very well be the second place team in the Eastern Conference. I think over the last two weekends, we saw CR and then Chicago back to back. In my mind, Chicago is much more skilled, but CR plays a much more cohesive team game. So there's going to be a battle for second there. And then Dubuque's going to find themselves in a battle with Youngstown and Team USA for four, five, and six. Like you said earlier, it's not out of the question that the Fighting Saints finish as high as third, probably. But I think that realistically, if they can focus and set their eyes maybe on that four seed, and while you always want to go higher than that, if they can at least get a first round playoff series at home, that would be huge for Dubuque. I agree. Uh, the you know the there's still two points clear of Team USA, but Team USA has played four fewer games, so that's a potential for eight points. And uh, I think the 18 still have quite a few games left. We have nine at least. In nine the games left. Yeah. So they're they're still uh, they're still a real they're a team that can rise pretty quickly with the 18s. Uh, but yeah, I think I think the Fighting Saints. You know, you, again, you play your best hockey and you you make sure you're playing. The way you want to play going into the playoffs, and the seating will take care of itself. Uh, but I think I think fourth is a spot where you'd where you'd hopefully like to be. Uh, the one thing, the one thing we talked about Muskegon. You know, I think they're obviously they're going to win it all. But I remember at, at one point we were thinking that they were going to win forty five games. Yeah. <laughs> and with only twelve games left, and they're at thirty five. I don't know that that's going to happen now. But uh, that's a team. I, I thought they were going to win 45 games. I thought the way they were playing in, in the first half before Christmas, I thought they were, you know, head and shoulders above everybody else. Uh, they've kind of come back to the pack a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a little bit of complacency because they've had such a huge lead or if it's teams just kind of catching up to them or, or the fact that they were a vet veteran-laden team in the first half and they were just so much more cohesive than everybody else. And now everybody else is developing that. That that could be part of the factor too. But uh, we'll see how that shakes out. I, I do think Muskegon is definitely the number one, though. And a big key for Dubuque is if you look at the Eastern Conference standings, the only team above them that they don't play at least once more this season is Youngstown. But they play CR twice more. They play Chicago two more times, and they play Muskegon once. Those are all you know, when you talk about them four point games. So they have a chance to really make up ground against each of those teams that are above them because because they play head-to-head, -head, and those head-to-head -head matchups are going to be very crucial. Opportunities. Mm -hmm. not, cha not challenges, not overwhelming, not underdog situations. They're opportunities, and that's what you want at this point in the season. You know, the schedule, you know, I think you can say it's a difficult schedule. I think a lot of teams in the USHL have difficult schedules down the stretch. But you have a lot of those games at home, uh, which is where you should play well. Don't have to travel a ton. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the farthest trip left is Chicago. from Chicago. Yep. Two and a half hours, you're there and back, and you're in your own bed by midnight, hopefully. Maybe not. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so the, the schedule actually is tough in terms of the teams you play, but in terms of travel, in terms of everything else, it's really not that challenging. Just a couple three-game weekends, not a ton. You know, it's manageable. So I think there's it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to beat these teams and 
and prove you belong in the playoffs and get some confidence going into the playoffs. A chance to make up some ground and a chance to be mathematically as high as second, really. But if you're looking at it more realistically, a chance to get up there to the three seeds still. Seven points back of the Cedar Rapids Rough Riders with the same amount of games played. Certainly not out of the question to think that you can make up seven points in 14 more games in this regular season. Now when we come back on the Fighting Saints report, our final segment will continue on with the Mount Rushmore, and this time we're going with the Mount Rushmore of all-time goal scorers. Alex Ovechkin just did something this past week that no other hockey player has ever done before.